I'm Jocelyn Aspa with the Investing News Network. We're here at day two of the Bloom Burton Healthcare Investor Conference, and I'm here with Dan Legault, CEO of Antib Therapeutics. Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. So how has the conference been treating you so far? It's been uh, day two now, so just want to get your thoughts on how it's been going for you. Well, it's been going very, very well for us. It's a very exciting time. And of course, you always know that spring is around the corner when the Bloom Burton Conference sort of hits town. Uh, so we last spoke earlier this month about how the company is tackling pain and inflammation with uh, naproxen derivative. Uh, then since then, uh, the Phase 2B GI safety results were published in the British Journal of Pharmacology for ATB346. Can you talk about that publication a little bit and sort of what that means for the company? Sure. Well, we're now in the middle of our fourth and final Phase 2 trial. We've done three already. One of them was a very large phase 2B GI safety trial. This trial was head-to-head -head against naproxen, our drug ATB346, against naproxen in a blinded study of 250 people with a doctor with an endoscope looking for three millimeter ulcers in the stomach, the true gold standard of ulceration. The trial was dramatically successful for, for us. Naproxen subjects experienced a at 42% ulceration rate. Our subjects experienced a 2.5% ulceration rate. So wonderful results. It was a very sophisticated trial. A lot of secondary endpoints were collected, and, um, and, and which of course we wrote up. But then the British Journal of Pharmacology wrote it all up as well. A very, very um, renowned peer reviewed journal out of England. And so we're very, very pleased that it picked it up and uh, had a long article about us. Um, so as such, the company could be a phase three by the end of the summer. Uh, what else can you say about this and how significant it is for your company? Well, of, of course, it's our lead drug, so being phase three ready is very, very exciting. We have already licensed our drug for 22 countries in three pharma deals, but smaller markets, Canada being one of them, um, and in the, in the fall, we'll be looking forward to uh, engaging partners in discussions for the larger markets of the United States, Europe, and Japan. So, th so that's a seminal moment for us, really. Can you talk about maybe why you want to target markets like Japan? Well, we want to target all global markets. This is a very large, well-known 50-year-old problem. Some people say a boring problem, but nonetheless a, a, a massive one, and it touches all populations right around, so we, we're, we're very keen on, on making our drug a global drug. Uh, so you have your other drugs, the ATB352, ATB346, uh, or sorry, the ATB34, 340. Can you talk about maybe how they differ from ATB346 and maybe those next steps being taken in those two candidates? Sh sure. Well, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs encompasses um, a whole range of drugs for a whole range of indications, both chronic and acute, and of course preventative drugs as well. So we're going after the whole period. We after the whole category, we have made such a fundamental discovery in inflammation with the with the core technology. The core technology is used throughout the three drugs. So as you as you said, our lead drug is is. Uh, our general purpose drug and primarily for the osteoarthritis market, so it's a chronic drug and it is a derivative of naproxen. It is a new molecule, new chemical entity, but a derivative of naproxen. The opioid crisis is uh, just a terrible scourge around the world. Uh, you can, can't even you know, open up, start your day without opening up a newspaper and seeing an article about the ravages of the opioid crisis, and so we're very, very keen on targeting that. Doctors in many cases would love to prescribe a strong NSAID rather than an opioid, not in all cases, but in many cases. And there are two strong uh, NSAIDs that would fit the bill, namely indomethacin and ketoprofen, but they are by far the most damaging to the gastrointestinal system. Our version of ketoprofen, however, in animal models shows no, da shows no damage, and of course our, our lead drug translated a, a similar results into the human context. So our second drug is for acute pain, strong, strong pain, and we are likely going to, uh, t as a target initial indication, likely going to target it after post-operative pain. A large number of, uh, a large percentage of opioid addiction starts with people uh, using opioids for post-operative pain. Are there any other things coming up this year that maybe investors will want to know about? 
And we're also going to be moving our low-dose aspirin drug, of course, um, moving that one forward as well. Low-dose aspirin, well, well accepted medically as as a, as a preventative for stroke and for uh, digestive system cancers, including colon cancer, a terrible killer, number, a terrible killer in the United States, for example. And our version, of course, no uh, bleeding. So, so um, in, in well, in, in addition to big results on our phase 2B um, this summer and initiating partnering uh, discussions. We're also, we will also finish what we think will be the seminal or the preeminent health economic study on the, on the, um, uh, on the, the cost of, of NSAID damage. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I just want to get your thoughts on maybe the U.S. and Canada healthcare systems. Maybe if, there, if you think there's any disadvantages or advantages to one or the other. I know they kind of get compared a lot um, in certain ways. <laughs> well, without getting too um, political, um, just staying more on the drug development side, uh, Canada is a wonderful place for uh, drug development, particularly in pain. Um, of course. Canadian scientists, U.S. scientists um, think much alike, and it's, it's science after all. And, and so the Toronto area it really is second only to the Boston area in terms of the breadth and, and uh, depth of, of uh, life science. However, in pain, there are statistical differences in pain studies between people who have insurance and people who don't have insurance, which is a problem that sort of plagues pain research in the United States. You have to do larger trials and more complex trials to, to come up with the same clinical um, re results, whereas in Canada, everyone is just on essentially government Medicare, right. and so it, it's just a beautiful apples to apples comparison right along the board. So I mean, the, the main pain assessment index in wide use around the world, the gold standard around the world, WOMAC, was um, stands for Western Ontario and McMaster University, so developed in Canada. No, thank you so much. Those are all my questions I have today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. I'm Jocelyn Aspa with the Investing News Network.